If you've ever paid for something with your phone, transferred money using an app, or checked your bank statement online, then you're already part of a multi-billion dollar industry. It's called fintech, and it's changing economies around the world. Fintech is short for financial technology. Seems simple, right? Well, the term fintech includes a huge range of products, technologies, and business models that are changing the financial services industry. It refers to everything from cashless payments to crowdfunding platforms to robo-advisors to virtual currencies. So every time you donate to someone's Kickstarter campaign, that's fintech. Or if you transfer money to someone using Venmo, that's also fintech. And that's just the beginning. Here at a major fintech conference in Amsterdam, Hundreds of companies are trying to disrupt the banking and finance industries by changing the way we pay and borrow money. And investors are buying it. Global investment in the fintech sector has added up to nearly $100 billion since 2010. In 2017 alone, fintech investment surged 18%. Startups focusing on payment and lending technologies received the majority of those funds. It's not just startups that are getting into fintech. Some of the world's biggest companies from Apple to Alibaba are going big on it too. Just think of Apple Pay or Alipay. One reason for all of this investment, consumers are adopting fintech fast. One out of every three people across 20 major economies report using at least two fintech services in the last six months. China and India are leading the way, with more than half of consumers using services like money transfers, financial planning, borrowing, and insurance. Financial technology has filled a void for people around the world who don't have access to traditional banking services. In fact, it's estimated nearly 2 billion people worldwide are without bank accounts. Now, thanks to fintech, all you need is your phone to take out a loan or insurance. Take Kenya, which pioneered a mobile banking system called M-Pesa. Kenyans access their M-Pesa accounts directly on their mobile phones to transfer money, pay bills, or take out loans. Today, an estimated 96% of households in Kenya use M-Pesa. And one study found it has helped lift roughly 2% of Kenyan households out of extreme poverty. The rise of fintech has forced traditional lenders, insurers, and asset managers to embrace new digital technologies. For example, wealth managers now have to compete with robo-advisors, which are automated financial planning services. I mean, talk about rise of the robots, right? Thanks to high-tech algorithms, these services are available 24-7 and can be more affordable than traditional asset managers. That helps explain why some robo-advisors already have billions of dollars under management. Like any growing industry, fintech isn't without risks, and some regulators have struggled to keep up with the fast pace of innovation. Think of peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms, where individuals borrow and lend without going through a bank. Compared to traditional banks, these services might not be required to set aside as much money in case customers default on their loans. This can be risky for companies and consumers. Data privacy is another major concern. As more financial services go digital, cyber attacks become a bigger risk. The challenges facing financial technology are likely to grow as more businesses go digital. But for many of the companies and consumers here, fintech is more than a buzzword. It's a big business opportunity. Hey everyone, Elizabeth here. Thanks so much for tuning in. Be sure to check out more of our videos over here, including one about blockchain and another where I talk to a company that's going cashless. Let us know if you have any other ideas for videos in the comment section, and while you're there, subscribe to our channel. See you later. When you're a manager and selling beverage alcohol is a big part of your business, you want to be focusing on your operations and your customers, not stuck in the office dealing with the manual entry of alcohol invoices or pricing and product issues. Plus, having to pay in cash, check, or money order at the time of delivery is just another disruption. That's why FinTech revolutionized deliveries with our Electronic Funds Transfer EFT payment system close to three decades ago. Our unrivaled nationwide distributor coverage and electronic payments for alcohol invoices serves as the foundation of our company, providing support and services to thousands of alcohol distributors across the country and growing by 50 to 60 each month. FinTech's payment source is the only EFT and data solution in the alcohol industry approved and available for use in all 50 states. Our expertise ensures your invoice payments are made on time and in accordance with all state liquor laws. 
From this nationwide experience, we have collected alcohol purchase data for decades, giving us the broadest, most accurate data in the beverage alcohol industry. InfoSource, the data and analytics branch of FinTech Services, has fueled the growth of our business and gives you the most timely data available. In fact, our data covers the largest source of retailer and draft purchase data in the industry, spanning chains and independents, providing our retailers and distributors with all the information you could possibly need right at your fingertips. This unparalleled scope of data is the foundation of our comprehensive platform, which provides you with powerful industry knowledge and effective strategies for growth and connectivity. This branch of FinTech offers rollout strategy assistance, unmatched distributor and retailer coverage, personalized customer support, industry partnerships, and integrations with route accounting software and back office systems. FinTech's solution also includes cutting edge business tools and products, such as FinTech's order source for PO management, credit communicator, and FinTech's price source, delivering you real-time product pricing and promotion information. This means you can reach higher levels of efficiency with services designed to simplify and streamline your business practices. Also, FinTech serves as the regulatory information resource in the industry. Not only does our platform provide user-friendly data and analytic reporting to equip businesses with powerful purchasing knowledge, we also act as a strategic advisor to connect and grow businesses through industry partnerships and provide electronic payments to save you time and money. From offering insight into regulatory issues, highlighting the latest news in the alcohol industry, to educating customers about the beverage alcohol business. That's why FinTech is the one source solution for the beverage alcohol industry. Our roots in electronic payments have grown to become a nationwide award-winning business working with thousands of distributors, processing more than half a million invoices weekly, and representing over $27 billion in payments annually. Contact us today to learn more about how our experience can help grow your business. I would like to introduce today's speakers, Larry Lagerstrom, who you'll be hearing from late, later in the session, is the Acting Director of Academic Programs, responsible for graduate education offerings. Today's featured presenters are Bruce Wallace and Ritika Graywall from Silicon Valley Bank. Bruce Wallace is the Chief Digital Officer of Silicon Valley Bank Financial Group. He is responsible for client digital banking experience and channel delivery services, along with the sales, development, and delivery for fee-based products, including payments, cash management, cards, merchant services, foreign exchange, and global treasury services. Previously, Bruce was Silicon Valley Bank's Chief Operations Officer, responsible for global operations and IT. Prior to joining Silicon Valley Bank, Bruce spent more than 20 years in a variety of management positions with Wells Fargo and company. Ritika Graywall is the head of payments, strategy, and solutions at Silicon Valley Bank. She joined the company in 2012 to lead the payment strategy and solutions team. This team focuses on internal payment strategy and development as well as working collaboratively with Silicon Valley Bank clients and partners to help deliver payment solutions to the market. She leads Silicon Valley Bank's partnership with MasterCard to run Commerce.Innovated, an accelerator program focused on helping early stage company, companies innovating across the commerce space. Prior to Silicon Valley Bank, Ritika was at J.P. Morgan Chase. Ritika was recently awarded as, one, awarded as one of the most influential women in payments. Actually, she won this honor for the last two years. At this time, I'd like to turn the floor over to Bruce and Ritika. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Bruce, and uh, we are excited to be here this morning to talk about what's happening with um, uh, the FinTech revolution. So, 
Uh, we're going to have some slides that we're going to walk through. As, as Beth had mentioned, uh, we'll be more than happy to answer questions throughout the course of the presentation and actually would uh, recommend that you provide questions throughout the course. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Ratika, who's going to start stepping through the presentation. Ratika? Hey, good morning, everyone. So um, I'm going to start first with a slide um, that um, we received some data from CB Insight, which is an analyst firm. Um, and what um, is going on in this side is really to help illustrate the fintech innovation is here. Um, what they did was use the Wells Fargo homepage as an example. At the top, the top half is um, the consumer homepage, and the bottom half is the small business homepage. And really. Um, describe all of the different companies that are innovating and attacking every single segment of banking, from lending to banking services themselves to investing. There are a slew of companies that are going after and, and truly disrupting banking as you know it today. Um, on the consumer side, there's some names that I'm sure you've heard of um, in the markets, right, on the lending side, companies like SoFi, um, and and others, um, as well as on the banking side, um, some of the banking um, startups that are um, trying to disrupt the way that consumers receive just the basic services that come along with a bank account companies um, like MoveIn. Um, there's a slew of companies focused on the, the savings side, um, savings, wealth management, um, you know, companies like Digit that help to automate your savings, companies like Betterment, Wealthfront, et cetera, that are focused on, um, on that wealth management space. Um, and then finally, there's a whole world of companies um, that are focused on sort of the payments aspect that, from a consumer perspective as well, um, companies um, like Bill.com to help people make um, bill payments easier, cleaner, um, and with a beautiful UI in front of it. Um, on the small business side, this, there's you know even more um, pronounced uh, disruption that's happening. From um, again, same 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 thing where pretty much every tab of that um, display from the the Wells Fargo example here is is being disrupted. You can look at again banking, lending, and credit. Um, I'm sorry, merchant services, insurance, um, all of those things are all being disrupted, again, by a wide variety of um, services. Some of the more well-known services, um, because they've IPO'd or are out in the market really um, aggressively, companies like Square that have truly disrupted the way merchant services are being delivered, giving cons uh, small businesses, um, extending the aperture of small businesses that are able to accept card payments as well as changing the way that people accept card payments. And then on the lending side, companies like Cabbage and, and, uh, um, and OnDeck helping small businesses get access to capital um, in unique ways. Um, is there anything else that you would add on you this slide? Just one thing I would add at the macro level is I, I think what, what's happened over the past, I would say, um, three to five years with a lot of these companies is every single one on there, it's a pure digital solution. So I think what, what's happening is there's a lot of disruption specifically around companies coming into the financial services space without the traditional infrastructure required with a purely digital or mobile-based uh, experience. Um, yeah, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the main disruption that's, um, or some of the main drivers that's causing this inflow of disruption, and we will talk a little bit more about how digital comes into play um, here. So the next slide is, is to sort of see the parallel that's happening in the UK. It's a very similar trend um, where, again, consumer banking, business banking is being disrupted um, by a whole slew of, of startups. Um, you, you know, obviously the, the Brexit news is fresh in everyone's mind, so it's a little, um, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how this evolves, but, you know, uh, given that SVB has an office in London, we get a, a good front row seat into seeing a lot of this as well, and it's, again, very similar in nature to the disruption that's happening on the U.S. side, um, but, and attacking pretty much every aspect. Um, of banking, lending, um, investing, et cetera, that, um, that consumers and businesses are, are focused on. 
Yeah, so there, there were a couple questions I think were pretty interesting that came up uh, related to the first two slides. The first one was, um, where is blockchain? <laughs> so uh, in terms of what's happening with the percentage of startups that are in blockchain or, or, or digital currencies, and in terms of overall venture investing, um, there's been approximately a, a billion dollars that have gone into uh, blockchain startups. Um, and in terms of where it stacks against all of the other startups that Ratika had been uh, referencing earlier, it's probably about the sixth or seventh largest sector. Uh, in terms of where a lot of the investment dollars are going right now, it's primarily going in uh, le the lending space, it's going into the, um, um, the payment space, and it's also going into kind of a combination of individual finance, consumer consumer finance, and then also into different types of investing, uh, individual investing in consumer investing, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, business investing. Uh, but if you look at the trajectory around investments in blockchain technology, it is on a very uh, high trajectory. Uh, and uh, in terms of what's happened so far in the first half of this year, there has been um, no tampering of investments going on in, in Bitcoin and blockchain. And the second question was related to emerging markets, such as Africa, Latin America, Asia. I would say, again, in terms of investment dollars, probably about 75 to 80% of the overall venture uh, investment dollars for fintech are primarily going in North America, in, in the UK and EU. Uh, I think in terms of some of the emerging uh, countries, because they still have a very high unbanked or underbanked population, a lot of the startups that are in those specific spaces are really tackling much more simplified financial services on just trying to get basic consumer products such as mobile payments into the hands of uh, millions of consumers that are unbanked. Yeah, and the other thing I'll say about that is um, in reference to some of the other uh, markets is the, the U.S. and the U.K. are very similar in terms of people leveraging credit cards and merchant services and things like that. Um, and in those markets, those, in, those base, that basic infrastructure isn't even there, right? So if you go to uh, Brazil, for example, the penetration of credit cards is nowhere near as deep as it is um, here, sort of similar to what you were saying, in terms of leveraging alternative ways of moving money. Yeah. And uh, while Ratika goes to the next slide, we're getting a lot of great questions. I'm doing my best to kind of synthesize them together because there are some common questions. So just to let everyone know, uh, and a few of them we're going to specifically address on some future slides. So I am watching everyone's questions. Just wanted to let you know that. <laughs> yeah. And the next slide really tar is, is meant to focus on why. Why is the financial services under attack? It's so aggressively by um, by all these startups. And, you know, I think it's because financial services represents 20% of the S&P 500 index. And um, if you just look at those, the names of the companies that are in the middle of this um, target, um, they are household names that um, have been in the business of of banking and pa providing payments for years um, and years, hundreds of years in um, uh, in in many cases, um, and you know one thing that's um, you know I, I have a colleague who's from Texas, and he always talks about Texas Tea, and the any, the banking um, global financial institution market is in the trillions, eight point five trillion. So again, reiterating the 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 the, the prize at the end of the disruption. Um, and this is uh, sort of an interesting fact from Accenture that they're estimating that full service banks, meaning the banks that offer sort of consumer banking and payments and things like that, um, you know, similar to like Bank of America, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, et cetera, could lose 35% of their market share globally um, uh, di to digitally and oriented disruptors. And sort of to Bruce's point earlier, it is digitally that they, these guys are getting, um, bringing their solutions to market. Yeah, I, I would say the two other factors that are, are primarily involved that we see uh, with respect to a lot of the fintech disruption is one is I think a lot of these solutions are offering speed and simplicity. Uh, and I think that almost everybody uh, on the call probably has a personal experience of dealing with a traditional financial institution that in terms of how long it took to, to finally get a product delivered or to get your mortgage refinanced or whatever, whatever it is, many times it's kind of a long, cumbersome process to go through that. 
And so a lot of the business models that we see that are being successful and getting traction, they really focus on speed and simplicity uh, in terms of delivering the product. And the second one, which Ratika referenced a little bit earlier, but I, I'd, I'd just like to highlight a little bit more, and that is it's really around the user experience. I think that uh, a lot of the fintech disruptors are very focused on starting with an experience that the consumer or the business expects to get that's maybe a little bit more aligned with what they would get from another software company or another technology company, as opposed to trying to kind of just provide a better financial services product. Many times it's not focused on the product because as I think everyone would agree, many financial services products are very commodity-based products. There's not a lot of differentiation around a checking account or a debit card. However, there can be massive differentiation in the user experience and using the products. And so speed, simplicity, and the user experience are kind of the real key areas that the, uh, the innovators are focused on in trying to get market share. Yeah, and that's a great transition to sort of the, the macro level themes that we see really the trends shaping the fintech landscape. Um, and so we talked a little bit about some of the um, technology that's fueling um, the disruption, right? The barriers to entry um, for, for entering in and bringing a startup to market are significantly lower than they have been in previous years thanks to wonderful things like the mobile devices um, and you know, the iTunes market um, place, I'm sorry, the App Store, um, where you can just get your product in front of millions of eyeballs um, uh, pretty quickly, um, as well as things like being able to host your service in the cloud without having to invest a whole bunch of money in um, infrastructure to bring your solution to market. And then lastly, um, leveraging the networks, the, the, the networks, the social networks and the um, the other kinds of uh, uh, networks to distribute your solution to market. So leveraging services like Twitter and Facebook and, and um, Medium and all those other channels to really distribute um, marketing at a very, very low cost have made the, the, end, the barriers to entry um, uh, significantly lower and have really helped to fuel the, the innovation. Um, it, it, there's also a big trend around trying to remove paper, and this is sort of along the lines of removing friction from processes and shifting from paper to electronic. Um, you know, the idea that checks will leave our ecosystem is a, um, is a reality that I really hope happens one day. But in the interim, the technology around, you know, remote deposit capture has made accepting checks easier and people moving to more cardless, to a more, um, sorry, cashless, to a card-filled society is really um, is happening significantly across business and consumer. Um, businesses like um, electronic payments, um, because of the richness of data that goes along with transactions and, and reconciling data and removing humans from being in the position to constantly move paper um, through processes is, is something that businesses um, have been looking for for a long time. So this shift from paper to electronic is, is pretty significant. So one other comment I would make, I, I've tried to synthesize four or five questions with a common theme, and I think the common theme is around people understanding the, uh, the value proposition around ease of use and simplicity uh, and speed, but uh, talking a little bit about um, how this works in terms of the current products that you use on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think on a day-to-day -day basis, what we're seeing with a lot of the fintech disruptors, again, that's a common trend, is they're embedding the payment experience directly into how you do commerce on a day-to-day -day basis. And I know Uber is a very overused example uh, in the innovation economy, but they are kind of a, a perfect example of how they have embedded a financial product, which is a payment experience, directly into how you use their product. And there are many other examples with Amazon and Apple and many others where, again, I think that uh, what, what we see happening with a lot of this, the disruptors is they're actually pushing payments more into the background. It's less around making the payment. It's more around making the payment digitalized and embedded in with the commerce experience. So the payment is much more of a utility as opposed to a product. And really, again, going back to what we talked about earlier, it's about the user experience. And many of the models that are doing a great job of, again, elegantly embedding 
the financial product into the experience that you're doing so you don't actually even have to think about making the payment or executing on the financial product. Like an, another example is in the, um, the small business lending, what we have seen is some fintech disruptors that are doing a great job of you actually never apply for a loan. They just look at everything in your accounting system. They look at your accounts receivable. They go ahead and qualify which ones they will advance credit on. And then it's literally as simple as pressing one button to say, yes, I would like to get an advance on my receivable. So again, what they're doing is taking the financial product itself and taking so much of the friction out of what you do to kind of apply and qualify and use it and embed it into kind of your day-to-day -day working experience or your, your uh, social experience. Yeah. Um, and, and sort of the last big trend um, that's really helping to shape the fintech landscape is the regulatory environment. So, you know, one thing that we've been talking about is when the, you know, great recession happened, um, banks sort of took a step back and started to divert resources away from driving innovation and driving um, new products and services and focus more on compliance um, and making sure that they, you know, Safety and soundness it was sort of the, the the big mantra of the time, and um, it always is in the world of banks. Um, but that left open a big um, gap in terms of innovation, right? So that le it was the big gap that allowed for all the disruptors to come in is that when banks stopped thinking about um, how do we innovate, and Bruce will say that banks are not really good at innovating in general, um, but when they completely stopped thinking about that, that's really when the whole world of innovation came out, um, just the general dissatisfaction with banks that came out of that, that crisis, as well as the focus on com regulatory compliance. And, you know, the, the, the world of, of regulation is not um, – easy by any chance, right? So the emergence of the CFPB um, happened during that time where there's um, a very strong champion out there for consumer protection, and then there's, you know, in the world of payments, so you think about things like money transmitter rules and regulations. It's a very complex ecosystem, and, um, you know, the financial institutions are sort of the the, the sort of gate in and out of, of the payments network. So the um, disruption that's happening and the successful disruption that's happening is in, in, in many ways in partnership with banks, um, helping to, to innovate around the front end experiences and the back end experiences while leveraging that infrastructure in the middle. Yeah, so a, a question that just came up very similar to what you were talking about, Ratika, is what are the disruptors doing to actually streamline and innovate the regulatory process? Um, well, I don't know if they can streamline the regulatory process, but the way that we've seen the disruptors work are, um, around or within the regulatory framework is, you know, focusing on the uh, the front end pieces, right? So if you think about the infrastructure of payments, I'm a payments nerd, I'm sorry, I can't help but not think about it that way. But if you think about the infrastructure of payments, um, there's ways to get into that infrastructure, and it typically goes through a bank. Um, and so the innovations that the innovators that um, are, are being successful at it are partnering with banks to get access to that um, to the, that whole world of, of payments infrastructure and looking at their services as thinking through compliance and regulation and monitoring and all those things makes them, you know, a very solid, um, you know, stable player um, in the yeah. ecosystem. Well, one other thing I would add that um, uh, has been interesting to watch and it's related to a few other questions folks have in here around kind of cost of switching and, you know, it sounds great to move over to some of these other solutions, but how frequently do I now have to re-enroll and, and do all of that? And again, I think what we see happening here is just leveraging digital and leveraging data that you already possess is a far more efficient way to do those things. So mm -hmm. to Ratika's point on the regulatory side, there is a specific subsector called reg tech of companies that are actually trying to streamline and, and automate some of the processes. And it's really about, when you think about it from a consumer and a business perspective, a lot of the data that banks or financial services ask for, you already have that data, but they don't make it easy for you to make that data portable to just go ahead and give them what you need. So everyone probably has a lot of sore 
fingers uh, from having to key so much into uh, various online sites and various mobile devices to provide data that actually is already digitalized somewhere probably in your mobile device or in your digital wallet. And again, I think what whether it's in the reg tech space or actually just some of the models that we were talking about earlier, I think they're doing a very effective job of minimizing the frequency in which you have to provide them data that they can get through another way, uh, through, through your consent or through your permission to allow you to, to go ahead and provide data. And I think that that has a huge impact in terms of the cost of switching. Um, I think that um, there's a direct correlation that the more information you have to provide <laughs> around buying a product, um, you know, your abandonment rate, I mean, there's a lot of statistics around abandonment rate with um, e-commerce shopping carts that the more data and information you have to enter, enter the more frequently you're going to abandon that. I think what a lot of these fintech disruptors are doing are minimizing the amount of data that you have to provide so that you can quickly get to a buy and move your business over to their, to their product or their platform. Yeah, and I think that getting your, from a switching perspective and a management perspective, getting your data moved over and or getting your sort of enrollment process is one thing. And being able to manage multiple different services that you've got so you're piecing together sort of a, a banking solution is, is something else that has changed dramatically with some of the um, advances. Um, that we were talking about in terms of technology. So before, you know, people would want to concentrate all of their banking and the financial services need with one entity because the um, overhead of managing all of these different relationships and entry points was so high. Now you've got an app for all your services. There's notifications that come out. So it's not, there's not um, the need to have everything so concentrated with one financial institution. You can have um, solutions that you manage through one interface, which is your mobile phone, um, that's that's making that um, that switch easier and sustainable. So, um, you know, how are I think I saw a few questions around how are banks responding um, to all of the the disruption that's happening and. You know, I think that a lot of, there's a, a wide variety of things that are going on in the market, but one of the things that we see um, a lot of is, is just some of the banks setting up their own fintech venture capital funds to make sure that they're um, looking and partnering and making investments in companies that um, they can, you know, either learn from, be strategic partners with, et cetera. So um, you can see here that back, uh, you know, from, one of 2015 to 2016, there's been, um, you know, a wide variety of banks that have participated in this strategy, either by setting up um, separate funds um, or just within their doing some balance sheet lending as well. And fintech investments um, last year was a uh, an all-time high of 11.4 billion, and despite some of the um, the easing that's happening in um, funding this year across the entire technology sector, fintech is continuing to see the levels of investment um, that it had seen and is um, expected to be even higher in 2016, primarily fueled by later stage rounds in companies, and we'll talk about some of those companies in a minute that are seeing some of those, those bigger rounds um, coming through to help sort of grow and accelerate their businesses. Is there anything else you'd add to this one? You know, one of the, uh, some of the questions that came in were related to what you spoke on the last slide, Ratika, about what, so what, what are the incumbents doing? They see a lot of uh, new startups coming into the space. Uh, they're, they're trying to basically um, uh, offer competitive products. In addition to the investing that Ratika spoke about a little bit earlier, I think one of the fundamental uh, challenges banks are going to have to deal with right now is how they think about their brand in the market in the future. And so the reality is FinTech has actually existed for a long time uh, because financial services buy a lot of technology from software companies and from hardware companies. There's actually been a sector that's been in existence for a long time of companies that specifically build products and sell them to financial services companies. However, the model in the past has always been we sell it to the financial services company, and then they white label it or they rebrand it with their brand, and then they, they put it out in the market. Um, what's 
been the, the real um, fundamental shift over the past three or four years are fintech companies that are going directly to consumers and directly to businesses. And I think a lot of financial services providers, going back to the last slide Ratika spoke to, recognize that there's a need for them to probably partner differently uh, with some of the fintech disruptors. But I think that this, this key question of, are they going to allow their brand to coexist? Uh, or are they actually going to allow their brand to maybe be pushed into the background and to allow one of the disruptors' brands to be in front of the client is a key decision point that a lot of financial institutions are, are grappling with. Yeah, and they may, they're may they looking at it at, at, from a demographic by demographic perspective as well, right? So what's that number again? 70% of millennials would rather go to the dentist than go to the bank. Um, so, <laughs> you know, there may be a different strategy that you're dealing, that you, you take um, with certain demographics around putting um, a startup brand more for, you know, in the forefront versus somebody in a later stage of their life that is more, um, uh, comfortable with the bank's brand being in front. So, um, you know, so there is, like we were talking about, a lot of money going into the um, financial services or financial uh, fintech ecosystem. And um, the one thing that we want to just talk a little bit about is that most of the value has yet to be realized. Um, there have, obviously, last year were some exits um, by OnDeck, Square, Lending Club, IPOing, and we'll talk a little bit about Lending Club in a little bit. I think there, I've seen a few questions come through um, on that. But then there's this whole world of other um, companies, um, you know, some would call them unicorns in the um, fintech space that where the, the, um, the exits, there have not been exits and there's um, a val significant value to be realized. Um, yeah, so what, one of the questions that just came up that I think is a, a good question related to everything we talked about is kind of the demographics of uh, fintech clients, whether it's consumers or businesses. And again, most of the industry data that we look at, as much as there's a lot of hype about it's really the millennials and the digital natives that are driving a lot of the adoption, actually we see it across. I, I, I think that the reality is, um, I'm, I'm personally a Gen Xer, um, I'm not a, um, a millennial, but it doesn't matter to me. A, a really good digital experience is a really good digital experience. And, and if somebody can provide a product or solution that is going to take 90% of the friction and the time I have to spend uh, enrolling or utilizing that product, it's appealing to me. And I don't think that that's um, very different across the different de demographics. So in terms of what the adoption rate has been, and what the penetration rate has been. Uh, on the average, it is higher with millennials, but it's probably not as big a chasm as people would think with respect to uh, Gen X or baby boomers. They're adopting a lot of the digital products just as quickly uh, as anyone. And I think probably uh, less around financial services, but I think the, the real great use case of this is Facebook. Uh, I think probably, you know, six or seven years ago, if you asked people who would be using Facebook from a demographic perspective, everyone would think, well, it's, 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 it's young children. Uh, actually, what you see is it's got tremendous adoption with the baby boomers. I mean, so, so I, I don't think financial services tech is going to be much different. I think as long as they can provide a great digital experience, and remove a lot of the friction. And probably the, the last comment I would make with respect to um, Ratika's point on most of the value has yet to be realized. I think that uh, we're still in what I would call an early stage of seeing how these companies are going to be able to scale to become very large, sustained uh, operating models. Um, and it's not because um, None, none of them have done that yet. Some of them have done that really well, but most of these companies have just formed over the last five to seven years, so it's going to take some time to see how they actually scale and how they become very large, sustainable organizations. Yeah, the other point I would make about sort of the demographics is several of these companies on here, like Coupa, for example, um, is, is, is a B2B solution, right? And so as the, uh, the world of, of business um, professionals are seeing the technology um, solutions sort of disrupting and transforming the way that they're able to do um, their their work or um, you know save time and money etc then it's going to trickle through to the consumer side as well so there is also that um, because it's not just a consumer only disruption it is on the business side that there's um, you know it, it, it has the potential to, to reach um, the broader 
populace. Um, you know, the, the one thing, to, and I've seen a few comments up there as well on this, is that the, the ones that have exited, sort of the on-deck square lending clubs of the world, it's, you know, hard to ignore the fact that they've struggled um, a, a bit amongst the, the current market conditions. Um, and, you know, I think that um, there's a, a variety of um, reasons for um, some of the struggles. There's just general... Um, market instability that's that's been going on as well as um, just some of the um, some of the things that have happened with some of these companies in particular so you know um, yeah I, 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 again I, I think it's very very it's very early still uh, I, I, w I think this chart will be interesting to look at over the next three to five years and again I, I would say if you go back and look at other areas around innovation. You look at the early days of when Apple became public or even when Facebook became public uh, initially, some of the challenges of going from being a, a private organization to a public organization. So I think that there's there's not enough data points right now to come to a conclusive, uh, conclu conclusive um, um, position on this. Um, but I, I, I do think that because of this, um, and there's a broader macro thing going on right now, uh, there's just less IPOs going on right now. There's less companies that are going public. So I think in terms of understanding the long-term sustainability and, and uh, market value proposition of, of many of these business models, it's probably going to take another, you know, five to seven years before we, we really truly understand that. Right, and and so because of this, because of some of the the early indications that are going on um, with the, the companies that have IPO'd, um, there it is trickling down to the private market. I mean, given the position that we have um, in the ecosystem, we have seen some of the um, some companies um, sort of pull back a little or um, have down rounds relative to um, you know the the recent fundraising that they're doing because of the the early um, indications um, uh, on these companies. But to Bruce's point, right, it's, it's still early days. Um, however, we are, we are seeing it. Um, yeah. what, what, one of the other things I think is unique about this sector, um, and I know there's been a lot of questions about um, uh, regulatory type questions or, around these companies. Um, I think that uh, first and foremost, if you just take a step back and look at the venture-backed startup community, uh, the reality is companies will fail. <laughs> That's part of uh, the innovation ecosystem is uh, um, the reality that uh, many startups will not be able to, um, to get traction, will not be able to uh, move their business model forward. I think what's a little bit different in this sector is because there's regulatory elements because it involves uh, financial transactions, uh, there's a different type of scrutiny around failure in this particular industry. Uh, uh, personally spent quite a bit of time with regulators over the past year talking a little bit about how they how they are going to approach regulating the fintech uh, community differently than uh, banks because the reality is the, the main goal of a regulator for a bank is to ensure they don't fail. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reality is within not only fintech but within the venture-backed startup community, th there will be failures. I mean, that is part of the uh, innovation ecosystem that happens. And in many cases, actually, it's, it's celebrated to a certain extent the fact that um, you know, failure will absolutely drive more innovation. If you're if you're not seeing failure, you're probably not taking enough risk, and you're not innovating. Uh, so I do think that's a particular area. Again, the regulators are going to have to really figure out probably a different type of model uh, for this sector because trying to just overlay the bank model, where the bank model is heavily predicated upon you will actually never fail. <laughs> if they overlay that model onto the fintech companies, they probably will suppress a lot of innovation. In, 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 at least in the limited conversations I've had with some regulators and some government officials, they fully recognize the need to have a, a modified regulatory model around these companies because they, they are not banks and, and they shouldn't hold them to a, not a similar standard, but they, they shouldn't try to overlay the exact same regulatory model or probably will suppress innovation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whoops, wrong button. 
Um, however, you know, given the some of the challenges that some of the disruptors are seeing in the fintech ecosystem, fintech will persevere, and the best companies will continue to disrupt. And so, uh, you know, I think that there's uh, like what this slide is sort of going through is, you know, there's companies that are sort of in their early days and are are presenting sort of significant. Um, significantly new, unique value propositions to the model and are starting to gain traction. Um, sort of the next tranche is where they've gotten sort of significant traction um, in their particular markets. And then finally, you know, the, the sort of the top share category is um, is, is really interesting and, and you know, are, are getting um, significant, gaining significant strides. Um, one of the trends that we're seeing, which is really sort of prevalent amongst this top tier um, or this top share category is they have entered the market in one particular um, segment. Um, you know, say like SoFi, for example, they started their model with lending to MBA students from the top 25 um, institutions in the company, uh, country and then have taken an, a, a broad approach to product development across more of financial services. So the first slide we started with banks becoming unbundled and point solutions addressing every single aspect of banking. Now we're seeing disruptors that started with that approach of let me unbundle, let me do that one thing better, faster, more seamlessly, and they're coming back and rebundling some things together in order to have a more uh, holistic solution to offer to the market. So I, we see that pretty much in all of these categories, these companies, that they are going back and trying to rebundle more things together in order to continue to drive the market. Yeah, I, I would say the other point to that uh, that most of these companies are doing, and again, it's very consistent with what you would see across the um, innovation startup community, and that is they try to get some product in market as fast as possible to ideate and learn. And again, I think that where one of the challenges the, the incumbents have is if you think about the model today around product design, product development, introducing something into the market, it's a very long cycle uh, for a traditional financial institution to do that. A lot of them are thinking about uh, accelerating that cycle, inclu including our organization, but I think the model of developing, f finding a pain point, like Ratika said, or finding a point of friction, quickly getting a product into the market, and then doing rapid ideation on that, and then doing horizontal product uh, expansion off of that. Uh, gives them an opportunity to quickly respond to changes in the market, quickly respond to client expectations. And again, uh, most of these companies on here will be releasing product on a weekly basis, if not on a daily basis, which is very unusual for a financial services organization to do releases that quickly of enhancements and new features. And I think that's a, a clear point of differentiation and advantage that they have in the market right now. Um, so I think that's it um, in terms of what we've got from a prepared material perspective, but I, I know there's a bunch of questions. <laughs> a pretty intriguing question is, will there be a point where banks are no longer needed? Um, and it's something that we spent a lot of time talking about, less around whether or not banks will be no longer needed, but what could potentially be the future role of traditional financial institutions? I'll start and then I'll let Ratika weigh in here. Um, so how, how we think that this potentially is going to evolve is, so first and foremost, um, financial institutions have a lot of incredible assets and infrastructure. Uh, they have trillions of dollars of um, federally insured deposits, uh, which are basically the um, the oil for the engine <laughs> to do lending and to do payments and to provide liquidity services. So uh, they have an incredible asset with respect to their balance sheets, uh, their infrastructure, the fact that they are regulated, they are trusted, uh, they have access to a lot of the payment clearing and settlement systems, uh, which are incredibly valuable. So what we think about is kind of the distinction between all of the great infrastructure services that a, a bank can provide and then kind of the consumer-facing products. And um, it, it, not the best analogy, but one of the things we think about all the time is kind of how Apple has evolved their model. And it's really interesting. Apple, uh, you know, the 
either the largest or second largest. I haven't looked today on their market cap mm -hmm. versus uh, Google's. But uh, in terms of um, what they provide in terms of an operating platform, uh, and I think people, you know, they think about their Apple device, but the reality is they're using so many other products that are built off of the, the hardware and the operating system off of the Apple device. And so I think that uh, what we could see evolving with some financial institutions is them being maybe more of an operating platform provider, uh, allowing a lot of other uh, software or client-facing technologies that, again, can leverage their infrastructure, can leverage their, uh, their assets in a way that they can still monetize that, provide some very valuable services, uh, but get the network effect. And I'm still on a little Ratika <laughs> thunder because the network effect is something she talks about all the time, of actually having other companies that are out there originating business for you off of your platform or off of your infrastructure. So um, we see kind of possibly not for every single traditional financial institution, but for some kind of an evolution to a model like that. But in terms of the broader question, will, will banks need to be in existence? Some form of an entity that can manage federally insured uh, deposits on, on behalf of consumers and can provide some of the major infrastructure services uh, we think will be a necessity. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that you've pretty much summarized um, what I was going to say as well. But, you know, I did kind of allude to it earlier, is that companies today, the startups today that are um, successfully innovating and success successfully disrupting um, in the back end are, are actually partnering with many banks. And, you know, we are a bank that will work with a startup and help them gain access to the infrastructure that helps power the ecosystem while they spend the time and energy focusing on the front end experience and, and gaining that network effect of reaching um, a broad customer base with their particular solution. So, yeah, I'm very much in agreement that I think that, you know, that infrastructure is still going to be very important in the future. Um, and there were there have been a lot of questions uh, about whether or not this has been recorded and whether or not the uh, materials will be available. And yes, they will be available. Correct. Okay. Uh, the recording will be available. The slides will not be available. Um, so uh, another question that just came in, which is pretty interesting, is. Um, trying to summarize this is kind of a long question, but uh, in, in terms of uh, what we have found through our own experiences that is the most valuable ways to Im improve the user experience or, or UI, um, since a lot of this comes down to the experience. Um, well, I'll, I'll let you start with that one, Ratika, just in terms of what, what we've seen in terms of working with fintech companies and venture back companies on how they approach that maybe a little bit differently than the incumbents. Yeah, I mean, I think that one thing that we see in, you know, uh, I mentioned that I, um, I that I run the accelerator program in conjunction with MasterCard called Commerce Innovated, and so we see some very, very early stage companies that come with their ideas and, um, you know, their, their businesses and help um, uh, to, to bring to market. And one thing that we um, see predominantly among those companies is they're all trying to solve a particular pain point that they've experienced themselves from frustration that they've got um, with the UI or UX that they've been um, uh, they've been struggling with. So they bring that sort of personal experience and that personal perspective um, to the solutions that they um, they bring to market. The other thing is they're taking influences from technology companies instead of banks. So it's the you know the how do I, um, you know, vote things up and down in Facebook versus, um, you know, how do I express preferences in the world of banking, right? So they're taking cues from the ecosystem of um, technology providers that they like and pulling those together to, and, and sort of driving unique experiences. Yeah, and I would just say the last thing, and it's a little redundant from what I said earlier, is uh, they start with customer or business expectations first. And, and really kind of the, the design process starts with the experience with the, uh, with the customer or with the business, uh, as opposed to the, the design starting with a product. 
And that's kind of a profound difference in, in a user experience development is really starting with the overall end-to-end -end experience that you're trying to deliver. And to Ratika's point, it, most of the time it's around solving uh, a pain point or eliminating friction from the process. And then the product is kind of built from there. Uh, the other thing that I think that they do very well, the ones that do this very well, is have a recognition of the necessity for backwards compatibility. And what I mean by that is a lot of these things that we've been, a lot of these models are built on other infrastructure, uh, or they have to have access to uh, existing clearing networks or existing payment networks. And creating that level of backwards compatibility is very important. So again, I think they start with trying to design a user experience first, and then ensuring that there's backwards compatibility about how that then is engineered and configured to work with an existing. So again, many times it's just about building a complete abstraction layer between the consumer and all of the kind of friction that can be created around the, the product. Uh, another interesting question that came up uh, was around PayPal in terms of their role around the fintech revolution. And I would say that they're one of the pioneers. <laughs> uh, so I think PayPal is unquestionably one of the first co companies, one of the first fintech companies that did have a consumer direct product and a small business direct product. Uh, and again, if you go back, and it's been a while, but uh, you know they were solving something very, very specific, but was very challenging, and that was how could individuals exchange value between each other if they weren't physically with each other? <laughs> and as much as we take that for granted today, the ease in which that that didn't exist back then. Uh, so the idea of if. I was in one physical location and Ratika was in another physical lo location and we wanted to conduct commerce. It was really difficult to do that. And again, uh, combined with kind of the birth of eBay and the idea that there could be a digital marketplace that people could go to to conduct commerce, I think that absolutely was a key aspect of helping pay PayPal get launched. But they, they solved something that was really big and that was how to how to create a digital experience where stored value could be exchanged between two individuals that not only are not physically in the same place, but don't even know each other. You know, they created a trusted network uh, where they could be in between two individuals who wanted to conduct commerce and really kind of facilitated a way to do it digitally that really didn't exist prior to that. So, so I, they were really incredible pioneers and it, it, they're, obviously an unbelievable success story just in terms of going back to what we talked about earlier about can these companies build sustainable, growing um, organizations. I think PayPal has absolutely proven to do that. Yep. One or two other questions? Well, that, but there, uh, there's a question in here about um, stage, do you recommend a fintech startup to approach at venture capital, um, a VC to, to raise money? Um, and it's um, there's a few different answers to that question, and I'm sure Bruce has got some opinions as well. But I think that today um, there's uh, venture capitalists tend to look for specific um, uh, factors when they're investing in a brand new company um, at the early, early, earliest stage. And I think today there are so many different ways to raise capital outside of the traditional VC model based on the level of experience that you've got um, bringing new ideas to market. Some of those alternative methods might be a good way to get started, right? There's um, angel investing, there's crowdfunding, you know, we talked a little bit, Kickstarter was on our one of our slides, um, there's AngelList, et cetera. So there may be a point where some of those alternative methods of getting some seed funding in place might be a better strategy than trying to go straight to a VC firm um, to raise money to get your product off the ground and then bringing in somebody um, of a more strategic nature like a venture capitalist to help you when you're at an inflection point um, is more of what we're seeing in the market. Um, uh, you know, for, for brand new founders. For repeat entrepreneurs, um, it's, uh, you know, going directly to a VC is still happening. Yeah, the mm -hmm. last comment I would make since we're at the top of the hour is I think for fintech companies in terms of getting um, venture funding, two things that they probably have to do that's a little bit different than other uh, uh, venture-backed tech companies is one is I think they have to prove that, they, or they have to show 
and demonstrate that they've got a robust compliance, risk management, and security. And I would understrike security uh, because, again, you're now dealing with some element of financial transactions. And I know there were a few questions earlier about cybersecurity, and I think cybersecurity is important in almost any industry, but in this particular industry, it is at the absolute top. And the last comment I would make is I think that you, you really need to demonstrate that you have a client acquisition and, more importantly, a client retention model. One of the things around fintech that, again, is slightly different than some of the other tech models is it can't be a tra transactional model. It has to be a relationship model where you're going to get sustained, continuous transactions from the individual on your platform and showing that you can not just do a single transaction with a consumer, but you can ha actually have a model that you can continue to sell to that consumer is very important. I think we're at the top of the hour. I think so. So again, thank you, uh, Ratika and Bruce. Very informative and enlightening. And thank you all for attending. I hope you will uh, come back again soon and attend one of our other webinars. So have a great day wherever you might be in the world at this point. The financial services industry is facing disruption. New technologies, shifting customer expectations, regulatory changes, evolving business models. Most recently, fintech startups have entered the mix, filling the innovation gap with new solutions for payments, lending, insurance claims, and investment management, just to name a few. To stay competitive, more and more financial institutions are focusing on digital products delivered as application programming interfaces, or APIs, and partnering with fintechs to find new ways to engage customers. Designed for this very type of collaboration, IBM Cloud for Financial Services offers a fintech ecosystem on a secure cloud infrastructure. It's an open development platform that lets you connect to a catalog of APIs curated for the financial services industry from leading fintechs and IBM, delivering analytics, data, content, and cognitive capabilities powered by Watson. You can collaborate and share ideas, code, and data online. Most importantly, you can build and deploy the next big thing quickly with new cloud applications built from APIs with the help of sample code and transformational financial services use cases that illustrate the art of the possible. With IBM Cloud for Financial Services, financial institutions can bring new, innovative, and regulatory compliant applications to market quickly to meet customer demands and stay ahead of the competition. Find out how IBM Cloud for Financial Services can help you build and deploy the next generation of applications powered by Watson for your financial institution. Explore for free by visiting IBM Financial Services. More and more innovative startups in fintech and insurtech, as well as banks and insurances themselves, are changing the industry with easy-to-use apps and solutions. One problem, however, prevents this revolution from taking the next step. They all use their specific interface for their data and information. Swiss Open Finance API seeks to change this by establishing a common API layer, which ensures a uniform and consistent way of managing information exchange throughout the industry. Think of an API as a translator module for an application, which transforms incoming and outgoing information into a format that can be understood by other applications and compatible APIs. We want to make sure that all players use the same set of translators and thus can communicate and collaborate easily and reliably with each other. This compact API layer will focus on key requirements of fintechs and intratechs, as well as customers, banks, and insurance companies. By keeping it easy to implement and secure, it will allow for rapid and effortless expansion of services. 
For banking, several API standards and data protocols have been developed over the last 20 years, a couple of which have since been updated and improved. Examples are OFX, FinTS, EBICS, ISO 222, or FIX. Insurance companies, on the other hand, currently do not yet implement a common API standard. Fortunately, their processes and applications are generally well documented. With these documentations, we are able to develop an API standard for insurance applications based on experience and proven processes. The SFTI approach seeks to combine the most powerful of these API standards into a toolbox we call Swiss Open Finance API, or SOFA. This toolbox will ensure performance and security in the rapidly developing fields of fintech and insurtech. Naturally, security is of utmost importance and critical to the success of this endeavor. Thus, we have formed a separate, highly specialized digital identity project at SFTI. Its sole purpose is developing measures that ensure the highest degree of cybersecurity. Numerous major Swiss players already appreciate the importance of a common API, and we are certain that many more will become our partners in shaping the future of finance and insurance in Switzerland.